much. Um, I have to give the you guys a, a compliment. The, the opening segment was a, a really beautiful um, rendition of the history. You know, in terms of the United States, looking at the the seventies and even the sixties in terms of our bodies ourselves. This is an um, an old sort of idea of self care, and what the internet has done is crushed the barriers. It's it's crushed the difference um, and allowed people to find each other online and accelerate the pace of discovery and accelerate the pace of sharing. Um, and yet, it's still very much about that primary care relationship um, that people have with their health professionals and even with institutions. Um, it's just saying that patients can be partners. Um, and Gio, I think, has the, has the best definition of participatory medicine. The definition, before I give the definition, it's important to remember that more than 80% of care is self-help, self-care. Even though, because I deal with cancer patients, cancer patients can't survive the, the, their connection with their doctors, but most of the care that they receive is self-care. And so, for years we've been discussing participatory medicine, and I think we came with a better definition, because participatory medicine, as we know it today, can't exist without the internet. So the definition of participatory, the definition of participatory medicine is it's a movement in which network patients uh, shift from being mere passengers to drivers of their care. And think about it, it's a real change of paradigm. That's interesting. So network patients being uh, instead of passengers, what was the expression? True shift from uh, mere passengers to drivers of their care. Yes, that's interesting. And so uh, you can look out for the, the Society for Participatory Medicine and, and epatients.net. I wanted to go just briefly over here for a moment. Roberto, in your site, it's interesting that you have both doctors and patients connecting. And, and what was your rationale for having the forum be for both doctors and patients? The uh, physician-patient relationship uh, has been always very important. And with this shift in the paradigm, uh, I, I don't believe we should jeopardize the good relationship between patients uh, and physicians. So uh, there are many different approaches. I think there, the, there is no one recipe to help to put on the web. Uh, connecting physicians with patients, maybe one single patient with multiple physicians, uh, from you know, uh, 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 without traveling uh, and, and many patients to see what other patients are doing with your physicians. I think this is an announcement and an empowerment of the physician-patient relationship, which I think is at the foundation of the good healthcare. Great, and we'll be coming to see uh, Roberta's demo in the second segment here. So I want to shift a little bit to a second theme Susanna raised, and that had to do with data versus narrative. And to the right of me, you mentioned there are two archetypes here, with Jamie Haywood and patients like me and Gilles Freeman from ACOR. Um, Jamie, can you comment a little bit on how that, that difference plays out for patients like me? What do you mean when you say it's more data-driven as opposed to narrative-based? Do you see that distinction? And if so, what implications does it have? Um, and, and some of this comes from sort of our background or our goals or intentions. So, so you know, my background is really fundamentally drug discovery, which is you know measuring whether things work or not, I mean, in initially in models of disease, and then ultimately in humans. And that is a that is a data driven process. Now, it's a data driven process that's flawed in the way we conduct it in many ways. Though it's served our system for a long time. And I think that the, the distinction between these two is really about what problem are you attempting to solve. And one of the really desperate problems in modern health is just how uh, disassociated the patients are from someone that actually cares about them, the process of healing, uh, and, and the need to find someone who's empathetic to your own need, which I think is really the story-based core of, that's really been the history of health. Not even, you know, whether the technology is the telephone or Defense or a listserv or email or whatever variable you go to, then the layer of, the layer that complements that, um, and I think that, that ultimately this is where we begin to move, is that it's now about, you know, what is the real fundamental information about, you know, the state variables, the, 
that someone who is a patient that is being treated with some different choices, and how do those change the life of that individual and the entire group in some quantitative and measurable way? And I think when you combine those two, you don't want to lose the narrative, but you want to, as much as possible, encode the narrative. Absolutely. And Jill, you've given a lot of thought to the role of narrative, both in ACOR as well as uh, in another project that you're working on uh, called the Moments Project. And can you tell a little, tell the audience a little bit about what that means to you, what narrative in this context means? Well, ACOR is 15 years old and more than 650,000 cancer patients and caregivers have used it. Have used it. And it's all about the narratives. What we have discovered is that because cancer is mostly rare conditions, for the most part, most people have great difficulty finding information from their physicians. And communicating with other patients, they often find information that is really life-saving. Because a group of a thousand or two, three thousand patients, or even a group of sixty patients for very rare diseases, know more about the disease than almost any doctor. And unless you are a patient lucky to be in Boston or in, in New York or in one of the three, four major centers, almost certainly you're going to receive care originally from a doctor that knows either nothing or very little about your disease. And so what we know from those 650,000 people, or at least those that have spoken, is that there is always a moment in which they realize that if you want to survive this kind of disease, you have to switch from being a passive patient to somebody that really becomes very active in driving how you're going to be dealing with the system, the physician, the treatments, and its continuum of care. Thank you for that. I, I've, I've been asked Jamie and Jill one more question because this section of the, the couch, if you will, is focused a little bit more on chronic disease. And that is, and I'm going to steal your phrase, Jill, that as we've come so far in Health 2.0 in patient communities, we've begun to really understand the topology of different diseases differently. And there isn't one size fits all in online communities for all conditions. Can you both talk a little bit about cancer specifically? And for example, you know, why that works in an ACOR-like setting? Um, and for example, Jamie contrasts that with why the conditions you've chosen to feature in patients like me. Why not patients like me for the common cold or for cancer or for breaking your life? Talk a little bit about the diversity. Sure. So cancer is the opposite of algorithmic medicine. It's really the opposite of having high blood pressure. Even in one patient, for many types of uh, cancers, let's take sarcomas, within one tumor, you don't have a single type of uh, genetic mutations. You have an incredible variation. And every patient that is uh, diagnosed with cancer, in fact, is a person going through a clinical trial with an NF1, 